Turn your Bibles to Acts 13. Title of our lesson tonight is, Are You Fulfilling Your Destiny? Already convicted. Are you fulfilling your destiny? You know, if you, if you read through the book of Acts, this is a, a little sentence that if you, if you don't pay attention to it, you can actually miss it. But there's a lot packed into this little sentence. Acts 13, look in verse 36. It says, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. So here's Paul preaching. And he's preaching about David and simply comparing and contrasting, hey, David died, was buried, and he's rotten in the ground. Jesus, that did not happen. But there's this little tiny phrase in the beginning. Here it says that God created David for a specific purpose in his generation. And once, God did not allow him to die until he served his purpose until he had fulfilled the purpose that God had for him in this life. Now that doesn't just apply to David, that applies to all of us. God created each and every one of us with a certain life in mind. He created you and me for a specific purpose. I have said from the beginning, our purpose is to go and make disciples. Right? I'm a disciple of Jesus who happens to be an employee. I'm a disciple of Jesus who happens to be a student. I'm a disciple of Jesus who is part of this work group or this team at school or I'm part of this sports league or whatever it is. That's my purpose is to then go and make disciples in every single one of those contexts. However, there are people that you are going to be able to meet and interact with that would not meet and interact with me. And so there, God has a specific, yes, we're all supposed to go make disciples. Yes, we're all supposed to fulfill that purpose in our lives. But there's a specific way. There's a specific bent to that. Right. For me, for the last 24 years of my life, it has been as a corporate trainer. To train people to go into organizations and teach leadership development, communications, uh, uh, anti-harassment, all these different things. And to go, I'm going to preach biblical principles in the workplace. They just don't know that it's biblical principle. But if somebody asks me, if somebody brings something up, I loved early on in my discipleship when I would have interviews. Because they would ask me, hey, Eric, uh, uh, how did you learn how to facilitate group discussion or how did you learn how to speak publicly how did you learn how to teach and train and the older that i get the more it's like well i've been doing it at this company and this company and this company and i took this class and this class and this class but when i was a young christian and i had the same kind of job it was like hey well i'm a I'm, you know i'm part of a campus ministry and and i got raised up and taught how to lead a bible talk which is just a bible discussion group and Oh, well, tell me more about that. And I'm like, oh, well, I, what I do is I kind of throw an idea out, a scripture. We read a scripture. We just, we just talk about it. And, okay, well, tell me more about that. And I'm like, well, I, I throw the idea out and somebody has an opinion about it. And I go, oh, that's great. Well, what about this? And, and I just kind of bump, bounce different ideas off of each other. Now, before I even knew that there was an actual word for that in the business community called facilitation, I was being taught how to facilitate a group as a Bible talk leader in my campus ministry. Now, the older that I've gotten, I've been doing the same job for 20 plus years. It's very, I have to like make myself weave in. Like it's hard to, to not rely on like, well, I did this at Meta. I did this at this Fortune 500 company. I worked for this company and I worked on this strategic initiative and we did this and this and here's the impact and blah, 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 blah. Because I'm so far removed from leading a Bible talk in a campus ministry back in the day. But I love being able to weave in what God has been able to do through me as a trainer. 
And it's going to be awesome going to heaven and, and hear about the people that I've shared my faith with in my classes, share my faith with my coworkers, those in, in, in work teams and, and CEOs and chief learning officers and all these different C-level sweet people that I've been able to impact because of the gospel that I don't even know of anymore because that was years ago. Or Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. There's a particular there's a particular purpose that God has for each and every one of our lives. Why was I born in Alaska? We'll get to that in a minute. The word purpose means the reason for one existing or being made. The reason for one existing or being made. Once you understand that God created you for a specific purpose, for a specific role, a specific destiny, it leads you to the question, are you fulfilling that destiny? Are you fulfilling that destiny? If you've never asked yourself, what is God's destiny for me? Then you are most probably a little or a lot off course from it. If you've never asked what that destiny is, if you've never asked what that purpose is, you're definitely not fulfilling it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Most people live for themselves and are given a destiny by their parents or the culture and they try to live up to it. You ever asked yourself the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? You ever been asked that? Okay, I'm going to ask for what, what you guys said when you were younger. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We live for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15. If you were brought up outside of having a relationship with God, so brought up outside of a, maybe a spiritual family, you were probably asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And most of us didn't really have a clue. Right? So let me ask, what did you want to be when you grew up? I want to be an FBI agent. All right, wow. all right. There it is. Or, or the military? Wow. Major League Baseball player. Major League Baseball? Wow. <coughs> yeah, firefighter. Okay. Wow. Military. military? Most guys is like, yeah, I want to be the army. I want to, <laughs> I want to shoot something. I wanted to be a runaway actress. A runaway actress. <laughs> Wait, a, uh, a, a Broadway actress. No, no, no. Like a, it was, I wanted to run away from home. <laughs> to be an actress. Okay, all right. Well, there it is. There. Uh, another one was a, an Olympic track athlete. Okay, wow. all right. Marine biologist. Marine biologist. I, I wanted to be a marine biologist when I grew was growing up, too. Wow. That's Adam and I, kindred spirits there. Yeah, yeah. Cheyenne, what do you want to be? A designer. Like, wow. what kind of designer? Like fashion. Like clothes, fashion designer? Awesome, that's cool. So... To get the greatest life on earth, you have to ask the question, what does God want to do with my life? What does God want to do? Not what does my parents think. Now, we want to get their input. I'm not saying don't consult your parents. But what is God? What's God's destiny for my life? God has you right where he wants you today. Listening to this Sermon. Acts 17, verse 24. Very familiar with this passage. Acts 17, verse 24. It says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. It does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. 
And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. God chose your parents to shepherd your soul, just like he chose Joseph of Mary to shepherd Jesus' soul. He chose where you were to be born, which country, which century, which year, and the exact day. Why? So that you would reach out to him and find him. So that you could have a relationship with him. This verse teaches us that not only has God got you right where he wants you, but he also has you right where he wants you today. That doesn't change. Early on, when I first started studying the Bible, I kind of thought that this passage only meant for those who were like studying the Bible. But if I look at my life, I think about, okay, why was I born in Alaska in the 70s? Late 70s. You're like, dang, 70s. You're like, you're old. Yes. Most of you could be my kids. If Ariel and I started early enough. Come on, Pops. <laughs> but why? Like Alaska, like it's so obscure. It's so obscure, Alaska. You know, like how many people have you met from Alaska? <laughs> like maybe two, you know what I mean? Like the most, or just one, you know what I mean? Like when I see an Alaska license plate, I saw Alaska license plate yesterday. I was driving what? down River Park and I saw like a new Alaska license plate, not the old school one, like a new one. And I'm like, I like trying to speed up and like I'm weaving between cars to try to like, do I know them? Do I know? You know? No, I don't know who she is, but. And I, don't, I never have the guts to like roll down my window and go, hey, hi, Alaska. You know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? But like, like it's very rare. So I'm born in Alaska. My brother-in-law and sister live in SoCal. Over the course of my life, they, I would go down there and visit. And, and, you know, even before that, my sister moved to Denver where she became a disciple. And uh, then she moved to L.A. Uh, we'd go down and visit her in L.A., specifically when she was getting married to a guy named Armando. And, uh, um, and then, like, they asked me to move down. And I moved down to Southern California and Long Beach to live with them. I become a disciple. And then I'm a disciple for about six years. I go down I, to Orange County and live with them again. And, and I get married to Ariel. We go back up to Alaska and we're part of a church up there. And we go through some really negative experiences in the church up there. Make some great relationships and we know a bunch of people. But then we, we decide to move to Denver. Denver, we become part of the International Christian Churches which we, that wasn't our intention of moving to Denver and becoming part of the International Christian Churches, but God had that in mind, and so we did, mainly because one of the big things that drew us in was because one of the guys that I had met while going to that church was a friend, or, or was the brother-in-law of a guy who reached out to me in Alaska. So we had that connection. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool, that's cool, right on. And now we move from Denver to the Bay, from the Bay down to here, and now God's called us to go back up to Alaska. Wow. Why? Like, who else is going to go plant the Alaska church besides an Alaskan who's, who's been a part of churches in Alaska, who's got heritage up there and family up there, right? Part of this, guys, is my destiny. It's the destiny that God has called me to. I was praying about it this morning, and oftentimes when I was younger, I would pray, okay, God, give me, like, give me like a word over my year. Like, I just want a word that I can focus on. Like, do, focus on this. Focus on this. You know what I mean? And uh, very early on, I'd say maybe about probably right as we were, the pandemic was hitting. So 2019 or something. God said, uh, kind of, you know, through the process of reading scripture and talking to people and I was just kind of like, okay, Eric, your, your job, what I want you to do, your destiny in life is to teach, to preach, and to build. Teach, preach, and build. So wherever I go, what am I going to do? I'm going to teach, I'm going to preach, and I'm going to build. Amen. I was praying this morning, and I'm like, God, why isn't preach, teach, and build? It's like, because that's not what I got for you. I want you to teach, preach, and build. So if you listen to my sermons... I'm preaching, 
But I come from a, la- a, 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 a language where I'm teaching. I'm not just preaching and hollering and jumping up and down all the time. Like I'm, I'm, I, I want to saturate you with the scriptures. I want to teach you the Bible. And I'm going to build. What am I building? What are we building here? We're building the kingdom. We're building the church here in Fresno. When I was in Northern California, when I was in the Bay, what was I doing? Building the kingdom. Whether it be in San Jose or when we went to plant the region in Contra Costa. Right? What what are we going to do when we go to Alaska? We're going to build. We're going to build. Right? This is what God has called me to do. And I'm living out my calling. I'm, I am fulfilling my destiny. Now, my job is to help you guys fulfill yours. Amen? But God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. That plan begins with us having a relationship with him. Forget having a destiny for God if you don't have a relationship with him. If you're not in tune with him, if you're not listening to his voice through the scriptures, if you're not talking with him in prayer, you're not spending a significant amount of your time thinking about God, doing the things that God wants you to do. If you're not, you're definitely not living out your destiny. This verse teaches not only that God got, has got you right where he wants you to be, but that he's orchestrating the parts of your life to get you where he wants you to go. All of it is so that you will have a close relationship with him. Let me tell you something. If you're not fulfilling your destiny, you will not be close to God. Anytime you feel like you're far away from God, anytime you're feeling like you're struggling, I guarantee you it's because you're not fulfilling your destiny. Now, that doesn't mean that every day I wake up and I'm like skipping and you know, eating Skittles and looking at rainbows and unicorns all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, don't, I don't wake up every day like that. And there are times where I, will, I do struggle in my faith. I do struggle with my destiny. But it, when I look back and I go, wait a second, what happened? I got off track. I got off focus. I started focusing on other things. I started focusing on my, the other things in my life that don't come down to teaching, preaching, and building. And I got distracted. And that distraction leads me into getting, feeling lost sometimes. If you're feeling a little lost today, that's because you do not truly know your destiny because you do not have a relationship with God as he wants you to have it. Amen, it's as simple as that. The closer you get with God, the more in tune with your destiny you will have and the closer you will walk with God as you're fulfilling and living out that destiny. You can know your Bible, you can be super religious, you can have Jesus stand right in front of you doing miracles like the Pharisees, yet still reject God's purpose for your life. Go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. This is a crazy passage if you think about this. And I believe that this passage describes 98%, if not more, of the religious world around us. Luke chapter 7, look here in verse 29. It says, all these people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they'd been baptized by John, John the Baptist. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected. Notice it doesn't say they rejected God's word. Notice it doesn't say that they rejected Jesus, although they did both. It says, the law, they rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. They rejected the purpose of God for their lives. God has an amazing, amazing amount of purpose for the Pharisees, for the religious people, for Israel. You guys know what's going on in Israel right now, right? Yeah. You guys paying attention to that, right? And a whole bunch of people are like, stand with Israel, stand with Israel, or stand with Palestine, stand with Palestine. I'm not here to get political. I'm not here to take a stand one way or the other. But here's what I will say. Political Israel is just as lost as the Pharisees were back when Jesus' time, if not more. Just because the people of Israel are Jews 
and they were God's chosen people back then, that does not mean that they're still God's chosen people. They still have to choose Jesus. But they are just the same as back here, where they rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. In our vernacular, they have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah and become his disciple and gotten baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Do not reject God's purpose for your life today. My first point is what controls you? What controls you will guide your destiny. Go to Luke 18. Just a couple pages over. Luke 18. Verse 18. It says, A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. What, you, know, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know, this man asked a common question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus did not answer the question the way that he wanted what this guy was looking for was a list of things. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. So then he could just go through and check the box, which is what he did. Hey, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus challenged the way that he thought. This man thought that in order to get to heaven, you need to be good. And the way to be good was to have a list of things that you do that makes you feel like you're better than the average guy. I think I preached a sermon on this a couple weeks ago. No one's good, Jesus says, except God alone. Your good deeds do not make you any gooder than anybody else. That's not even a word, but it's okay. You guys get what I'm saying. He was consumed with justifying his life before man and before God. Hey, I'm good. I did this. I did that. I do this. I do that. So I'm good. You can't hold anything against me. But Jesus knew his heart and that he was in love with being rich, yet felt guilty about it. And so he was consumed with doing good things to justify his wealthy lifestyle. He wanted the American dream, if you will, to have it all and go to heaven. Yet this young man was controlled by his sinful nature, his greed and his religiosity. So much so that when Jesus clearly told him the solution to give up his wealth and give it to the poor and follow him, did he do it? No. In fact, he walked away sad. Mm -hmm. He was not truly free. He was captive to sin and did not even know it until he was told to fulfill his destiny for which he was created, to be a disciple of Jesus. Think how many disciples he could have made of his friends and his family had he followed the destiny that Jesus had for him. I mean, think about doing something that radical, selling all your possessions and giving to the poor and then following Jesus. Whoa, what did you just do? I'm following Jesus, man. Why did you give up your wealth? Are you insane? No, let me tell you what's insane. What a testimony. What a story. So let me ask you, what controls you? What is stopping you from fulfilling your true destiny? Is it family or is it peer pressure? Addictions? The desire to be accepted by people to fit in with what the world believes today? Whether you're a disciple or not today, you cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom and expect to fulfill your destiny. You have to be all in. Desire to be accepted by people will always crush your destiny. That's right. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says this. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive 
through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. What is he saying here? He's saying if you focus on your job or your career, money or greed or the desire for material things, habits, living a life a certain way, scared to change, fear of the unknown, you're operating and you've been taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depend on human tradition and the spiritual elements of this world rather than on Christ. Amen. You can even operate in a religious way and that will be the same thing. True freedom to fulfill your destiny comes from holding on to Jesus' teachings. Right? We know this from John 8, 31, 32. Go ahead and turn there. Come on, bro. John 8, 31, 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. What sets us free? Not just knowing the teachings, but obeying the teachings. Actually doing what the Bible says will set us free. When was the last time that you really read the Bible? Like really read it? Back to the old days of eagerly examined every day, even if the old days was two weeks ago. <laughs> eagerly examined every day. I want to challenge you. Study the Bible. Dig deep. Get to know what God's destiny is for you. Not just to know Jesus' teachings, but actually do them. You need people to help you, and that's why God created the church. That's why God created discipleship. That's why God created community. This man had the chance to give it all up and be free for the pressure of this world and hand his life over to Jesus to give up trying to control his own life and trust God to look out for him. To not have to worry about anything anymore. Just let God do the planning for him. And yet he rejected his destiny to follow Jesus and become one of the greatest men that ever lived, a disciple of Jesus who turned the world upside down. Are you like this young man today? Are you being deceived by Satan and sin to your own destruction? You know, I brought up this idea of a monkey with nuts or fruit inside of a jar a while back. And how he grabs the stuff in the jar, but because his fist is bigger than his hand was, he can't get his hand out of the jar. And so he's trapped. He's trapped. And he's so greedy that he will not let go in order to free himself. And so what happens? Hunter comes up. Oh, hey, I got him. Now I got monkey brains for lunch. Could even be the bull in the matador. You guys ever watched any bullfighting? Yeah. Right? Death by a thousand cuts. When, a, when a, a bull and the matador with the red, you know, the beautiful, ornate, you know, like uh, garb, you know what I mean? And then they just keep stabbing him. He just keeps stabbing him. Right? Ole! And he runs by. And as he runs by, he just kind of switches off to the side and then slices him. And then he comes over and runs again, slices him again. And eventually it'll wear that bull down so much. Right? If you watch it, you'll see the bull at that hump that they have on the back of their back has a bunch of little spears in it. That's how Satan gets at us. Is we're playing with Satan. He's slicing you. Wow. Slicing you. We run after what's in front of us rather than seeing the bigger picture. Or a boiled frog. You put a frog in a pot. Nice. Starts to warm up a little bit. At the first, they start jumping. And then if you turn up the heat just a little bit and it gets nice and warm, they feel like they're kind of in a sauna, you know, a little, little spa, you know what I mean? 
And then slowly but surely you keep turning up the heat to finally they die because they've boiled themselves to death. We end up being in a situation that if we, if we had not, uh, if it had not crept up on us, we would have never found ourselves in. Or the wolf. You know, how do you catch a wolf? Back in the, back in the day, you'd, you'd cut, you'd put blood on a knife and you'd put it in the ice and it would stay there, the blade up, but it's got all that blood on it. And so it would come and the wolf would come and the wolf would sniff the, the blade and then the wolf would start licking the blade, mm. licking the blood off the blade. But as the wolf would lick the blade, what would happen? It would cut their tongue. And as they cut their tongue, they're thinking that they're licking the blood that's on the blade, but now they're actually licking their own blood. And so they would end up bleeding to death. Wow. Hunger for something pleasing that led us to self-destruction. Like the wolf and the blood on the blade. Jesus called this man to a different life. And God is calling you and I to live a different life. If you're not a Christian today, you need to become one. If you're a weak Christian, you've got to become a strong one and do something great. It's your destiny. That's right, bro. Come on. Point number two, my last point, are you living the dream? Come on, bro. Luke 18. Luke 18. Continuing on this story, Jesus is like, Saying, hey, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is the response of the disciples. Luke 18, look here in verse 26. To those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Is it possible to fulfill God's dream for you? There was genuine shock from Jesus' disciples that Jesus was so hard on this rich young ruler. Maybe you would have thought the same thing. Like, come on, man, like, like, make him sell everything? I mean, how about just make him sell some of it? You know, like, <laughs> like why are you being so difficult, Jesus? They thought that if this religious, if this religious man who ticked all the boxes, good man could, could not be saved, then how can anybody be saved? They still have a long way to go to understand what God expects you to give up everything and trust completely in him to direct your life. And what does he say? He says, look, if you've left everything, everything's going to come back to you. I mean, many of us have been afraid to give up our families, to give up old friends, to give up old relationships, because we actually just don't trust God that he's going to come through for us. And so we live in this perpetual state of one foot in the kingdom and one foot out of the kingdom, rather than drawing a line saying, no, that is unrighteous, that is wickedness, that is false doctrine, that is an unhealthy relationship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't go that way. It's done. I'm going to walk towards Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 37, Jesus says this, For no word of, from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. What does this mean? That means that the words of Jesus when he says that, hey, if you've left everything, you're going to get even more and eternal life. Yet everything seems impossible without God. More to the point, how can you be saved? Jesus was driving the point home. You cannot save yourselves. It is God who saves you. It is impossible as a person to save yourself, no matter how many good deeds, how many talents you have, what your education is, what your wealth or health is. None of that will get you saved or even keep you saved unless you have God. Mm -hmm. Peter's quick to let Jesus know that they've all given up everything to follow him, which is the cost 
of following Jesus, right? Remember, the 10,000 and the 20,000, what were the terms of peace? Anyone then who does not give up everything they have cannot be my disciple. Jesus is just telling the rich young ruler the exact same thing that he told everybody else. Jesus is quick to address Peter's way of thinking. It's not about how much one gives up as a Christian. It's about how much one gains. If you're thinking about how much you're giving up in order to be here, how much you're giving up in order to become a disciple, how much you have given up in order to become a disciple and stay faithful to God, that's the wrong question. You're already in the negative. You're already thinking the wrong way. And if you keep thinking that way, you are going to fall away. Mm-hmm. That's super true. What are we supposed to be thinking? How much have I gained? Look at all these friends. Look at all this family. I've got, I've got men and women in my life to be big brothers and big sisters. I, I get so taken care of. I've got men who are like taking me out on dates that actually like care about me. That aren't just trying to get in my pants. As, as, as a brother, like, I have sisters that actually care about me. That actually, like, don't want to try to manipulate me into giving them this or that. Or this, like, all the things that women in the world do. That's right, he says, very truly, he said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. If God will take care of you until you die and provide you with everything, then why is it so hard to give up your wealth? Which is so uncertain. You know, it's funny. Uh, Frankie's not here, but Frankie's been learning about how to do a, be a day trader. So on the side, you like put in 20 bucks into this like investment account. And, you know, like you can, you can ask him like, how you doing? Oh, man, I just lost. <laughs> now, what did he put in? 20 bucks? You know what I mean? He bought it like a buck 80, so he made like, you know, like a dollar 50 or something like that. And now it's back down to a buck 80. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you haven't lost any money yet. But it's like, oh my gosh, I got a lot of money. No, I don't have any money. Oh, I like, that's wealth. I got a little crypto. You know what I mean? Put a little crypto away. I look at it every day. And all it does is whoop, 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 up and down, up and down. Like, it stayed the same 250 bucks for like the last, you know, 10 months, 12 months. It's like, I'm not making any, like, and if I, if I walk through, for those of you that have the, you know, apps that you could do this on, you could like, okay, how much have I gained or lost today? And then you click the button that says this week, then this month, then this year. I go to the year, I'm up $1.85. I go to the week, I'm down $3.82. Like, it, it's, it's up and down. Why? Because we're focused on wealth. Money is not going to bring us happiness. It's so uncertain. Why is it so hard to give up a job or a career for him when he knows where there is a better job for you? He's prepared it for you. I can't tell you how many times I've chosen to not take on a job for the sake of the kingdom. It's, it's practically ruined my career. Like today, I could be a chief learning officer at a startup company in San Francisco making upwards of three to $500,000 a year. But because I want the flexibility and I want to spend time, not, and this isn't even just me as a minister, like this is just a regular job. I want the flexibility of being a disciple of Jesus. Now that doesn't, that's not to say that I couldn't be a disciple of Jesus and have a job like that. But I definitely couldn't be a guy who teaches, preaches, and builds and have a job like that. So in order to live out the destiny that God has for me of being a teacher and a preacher and a builder, I've had to choose different jobs. I've had to choose to go this direction versus that direction. Well, that direction would pay off our debt like that. Well, this direction, we'd be able to buy a house. This direction, we'd be able to... No, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little longer to pay off my debt. You know what? Maybe Ariel and I will just rent for the rest of our lives. Why? Because that gives us the opportunity to live out the destiny God has for us to teach, preach, and build. 
And if I just look at those decisions that I've made up to this point now, there wouldn't be a church in Fresno had I not made those decisions. There won't be a church in Alaska, and many of you might not even be disciples if it wasn't for those decisions. Fulfilling God's destiny has eternal consequences, but it also has eternal rewards. And the biggest reward is seeing the faces of the disciples that you get to make along the way and the disciples that those disciples get to make. It's going to be so awesome coming back here in five years, ten years, and seeing all the people that you guys are now leading, that you guys are in this position. Some of you are going to be in this position, and I'm going to be at your campus, Devo, that has thousands of students, hundreds and thousands of students here in Fresno, when we've got 12 here. You know what I mean? It's going to be nuts. And I'm going to be able to look back and go, if I didn't fulfill my destiny in Fresno, none of this would be here. Come on, bro. None of this would be here. <laughs> Why is it so hard to give up a boyfriend or a girlfriend when he has literally created the perfect person for you if you will only trust him and direct him or allow him to direct you? Why is it so hard to stand up against your family and friends when you understood God had chosen you to be the one through whom they will be saved? Come on, bro. It's time to let go of your life and start really living. John 10.10, my favorite passage in all the Bible, says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Satan wants to destroy your life. But here's what it looks like. It does not look like destruction. It looks like comfort. It looks like ease. It looks like getting what you want. But in the end, it leads to death. God's way initially looks hard. It looks difficult. It looks like you're giving up good things for what? Maybe nothing. That's Satan's ploy. But really, you're getting life to the full. You're getting an abundant life. You're getting a full life. If you're not living a full life today, then here, let me, just, let me just be real honest with you. You're allowing Satan to steal, kill, and destroy you. Yeah. If your life is not vivacious and exciting in your relationship with God, then you're allowing Satan to influence you, and he's stealing and killing and destroying. You've got to change your focus. Most people settle for living a comfortable life and never really live because we were made for action. We were made for action. Five things happen when you stop physically exercising. Number one is you lose muscle mass and therefore strength to live the life that you want to fully physically. I think I preached on this a little bit ago too where I like saw my arms like way, way getting down. You know what I'm saying? Like... I got to worry about that. I got, it's, it's not a good situation. Number two, your blood pressure rises very quickly. It's harder to get oxygen to the places in your body that need it the most. You put on weight leading to other problems. Grumpiness takes over as you stop releasing feel-good endorphins into your body. So we know that. What are five things that happen when you stop spiritually exercising? Quiet times, giving, evangelism, studying the Bible with people. Number one is you lose spiritual mass and therefore the strength to live the full spiritual and emotional life that God has for you. Number two, anxiety levels rise very quickly. Number three, it's harder for you to take on the word of God that leads to damaging your heart, giving way to potential spiritual heart attacks. You put on a worldly way of thinking where you see only more problems, not opportunities for God to work miracles. Grumpiness takes over as you stop igniting the Holy Spirit in you that gives you joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Bible calls that quenching the Holy Spirit. You and I are called to be spiritual athletes seeking out every adventure God has prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, works with God prepared in advance for us to do. 
God prepared this destiny in advance for us to do, but he is working on getting us through these stage gates so that we can be prepared for the ultimate destiny. Come on, Lord. Just like if I'm an athlete and I'm going after a big game or I'm going after a big run or some sort of competition, I have to work to get myself in physical shape to get there. That's right. mm-hmm. The same thing for us spiritually. Yeah. Every one of you have a mini destiny that you are living out right here on campus that is ultimately getting you to a place where you can live out your ultimate destiny. Alaska is going to get planted not because of Fresno, but because I started spiritually working out in Long Beach, California in 1999. Amen. And every stage gate up to that point. When you do this with all your heart, seek his destiny for you. What an adventurous life you'll live. I've been able to go places I never thought I'd be able to go. I've been able to do things that I never thought in a million years I'd be able to do. Now, I'm kind of lucky because I have a twin brother who's not a disciple. And so I can look at him and go, that's what my life would be like had I not become a disciple. He's never been out of the country. He's only had one real road trip, and that was right after high school, where he kind of did a, 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 like a drive-through tour of the entire United States, just kind of went all around it. Wow. He was gone for like a month. Well, that's, a, that's, that's a fun trip, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he's, he's never been out of the country. He's never been able to, to teach and preach on stages the way that I have. He's never been able to have the impact spiritually that I have had. He's building his life, not the kingdom. And he got, doesn't have a purpose. And so he lives his life, he kind of is angry all the time. Seems to be frustrated all the time. Why? Because he's not choosing to live out his destiny. Now, prayerfully, that'll change when I get to Alaska, amen? Come on, amen. But the reality is, we live an adventurous life if we're disciples. That's how you got to see this life, guys. It's an adventure. But if you watch any action-adventure film, there's a lot of perilous danger in that. There's a lot of things you got to pay attention to in order to get there. But in the end, you're living out this destiny. Jeremiah 29, 11, we're all familiar with this passage. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Here's the thing. Your destiny is in the middle of a maze. And the quicker you put all your energy into finding the quickest way to get out of it, the better. Yet Satan has created a lot of wrong turns and false tunnels to wear you out, to make you feel weary, so you'll give up your destiny. Yet, it never moves. The only thing that moves is your desire to find it. This is not, I forget what, des- what, what uh, if, if you're a Harry Potter fan, I forget what kind of like maze that is, where like the walls consistently like change and stuff like that. What is it called? Well, it could be a labyrinth. But if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Okay? That's not God's destiny for us. It's constantly these changing walls, and he's constantly, like, throwing curveballs and stuff. No, that's Satan throwing curveballs. That's Satan changing things, leading you down the path that leads to nowhere. God has the perfect path for you in order for you to fulfill your destiny. Look back across this year. And look into the next year. There's only three things that are going to limit your destiny. Number one is your relationship with God or a lack of it. It's the number one thing that's going to ruin your destiny. Number two is your courage to live for God. Your courage to take those risks. And number three, your imagination in what God will do for you. Your imagination 
in what God will do for you. Let's wrap up here. The end of Luke 18, verse 27. The Bible says, What is impossible with man is possible with God. God invites us to use our imagination for what is possible. What is your dream? What is the great adventure that you want to go on with God? It's possible. You've got to find your destiny. There's a poem I want to close this out with called Fulfill Your Destiny. When God created you, formed you and molded you at the start, he whispered your destiny into your bones, your muscles, and your heart. Hidden within your unique body, mind, and soul, he planted a life in which you would live for a singular particular goal. This destiny is only awakened, nurtured, and grown by turning to God's fueling spirit, which only he makes known. As you read his word, the plan becomes clear, but only with the prayer, only with prayer can you embrace your destiny without fear. For adventures are full of rough and untamable seas. Storms must be weathered for you to become who you must be. Scars are a given and bones must be broken to become stronger. So you learn to live by faith and not your own wisdom any longer. So take courage and join with the heroes of the past for your life was never meant to last and last. Live a life worthy of an eternal angelic song and make sure you are welcomed into heaven where you belong. My family, let's go after fulfilling our destiny. Amen? Amen. Amen.